So Rockefeller, oh, we're good. Yay, welcome to the January meetup, uh, the Drupal NYC meetup. My name is Alex Ross. I will be your MC this evening. Um, I haven't been here for a couple, a couple meetups, so uh, our, our friend Mai, I don't know where she went, but she was filling in, so thank you to Mai. She's back there. Um, this is the January 20, uh, 2016 meetup, which means we're, we're just under five years until Drupal 9 comes out, so that's good. Come on, that's, that, I, that's my joke for the new year. There it is. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, first of all, a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, the women's room is uh, middle of stage left hallway. So I guess this hallway, go all the way down the hall, and it's about halfway down. Uh, the men's room is on the other side, all the way down. Um, if you have any devices that go whiz or bang, uh, please put them on mute. Uh, we are recording this, so um, we don't want your phone ringing in the middle of the recording, and we don't want you to bother everybody else. So please make sure that your cell phones and other devices are on mute. Uh, if you're going to be asking a question, please make sure you have one of these microphones, right? Just wave your hand at the appropriate question time and someone will come running with a microphone. Um, if for some reason you ask a question and you don't have a mic, uh, to the speakers, please repeat the question. Someone remind them, repeat the questions. So that we make sure we get it recorded. Um, so that's just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, the agenda, so we have some pizza, we have some uh, socializing, we have uh, all that's been going on. Announcements, that's what's going on right now. Introductions, we'll do in just a minute. Um, at a, about 10 to 7, we'll have some talks. We have three great talks lined up tonight. Um, we have, uh, it, there are three um, uh, kind of, I don't know what we call, what's the opposite of a lightning talk? They're, they're regular sized talks. Um, what? Come, come non-lightning talks. Uh, sometimes we do have like quick five-minute lightning talks on a very, very, very specific topic or just like a one quick question. Um, but we have three, you know, kind of party talks tonight, which will be great. It's Thunder Talks. Sure. Thunder Talks, ho. Huh? Anyone? That's, there's only a certain age group that will get that. Um, uh, afterwards, we'll have a couple like, like two-second closing remarks from some people. And um, after this meetup, we typically meet down at Bill's Bar, which is downstairs on 51st Street. There's an entrance right on 51st Street. We are typically in the downstairs. The Bill's Bar has an upstairs and a downstairs. We are typically in the downstairs area um, by, the, by the bar, by Bill's Bar. Um, so please join us there and have a drink. Say hello to someone you don't know. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. Any questions, comments, concerns, jokes? No. OK. Um, all right, so the talks this evening, we're going to have, like I said, three great talks. Uh, Greg Lowenthal is here. He's going to be talking about uh, mobile site experience and where that's going, evolving your mobile site experience. Uh, our very own Mai, I always say Irie, but I always, I never have the confidence that it's Irie, um, is going to be talking about Teammate um, and what that's all about. And then we have uh, a talk by Eugene Israti about microservices architecture. So he's going to be coming up and talking about that. So three great talks. Um, at some point during the evening, I might kind of wave and, and go out into the hallway, either over here or over there, and let everybody know. Uh, I often do a newbie boff. A boff is birds of a feather. Um, basically, anybody who has like really super specific Drupal questions, or, you know, or questions about their, their websites or things like that in general, um, or they're new to Drupal and they're, they're trying to figure out the community, they're trying to figure out the technologies that are involved, they're trying to figure out like where do I get started, what do I need to learn, what don't I need to learn, all those kind of good questions. Um, I'll, I'll wave and let everybody know that I'm going out into one of those areas. And you can come find me and, and ask me anything that you can come up with. And if I know the answer, I will share it with you. And if I don't, I will lie and tell you that I do. Um, so please, you know, come find me at some point during that. Um, you don't have to lie. Well, no, I, but I will. I, I'll just make something up. So it's fine. Um, our organizers, there's a picture on the thing that these are all of your organizers for the evening. Uh, we like to put this, this up so that everybody knows who to go and, and talk to about the meetup. And if you have questions, if you want to be a presenter one day, uh, as in like four weeks from now, if you want to present something, um, come talk to one of the, uh, one of the organizers and we'll, we'll um, kind of answer whatever questions about the meetup that you have. The guy on the right, the, on the right, on your right or my right? On my right is Ben Jevons, but he wasn't able to join. But on, on your right is me, so I'm Alex. How are you? 
come find me. I will direct you to the right person, because I probably won't be able to help with whatever it is you're asking for. Um, but I will tell you who you can talk to. So I'm a good person to come find. Um, oh, I never mentioned it, but note on the bottom of every one of these slides is information on how to get on Wi-Fi around here. Um, and um, also the links to our Twitter and our meetup and all that good stuff. So take note as I go through the slides if you need to. Um, ah, venue, food, and drinks. So we have this great new venue. It's actually not that new for us anymore. I think this is maybe our fifth meetup here. Um, but this venue and the drinks, the pizza, and the, and the sodas and whatnot in the back have been sponsored by NBCU Technology. So thank you to NBCU Technology, whoever you people are. Hey. Thank you. Um, uh, but yeah, they, they very generously said that they'll uh, you know, let us keep using this space. Um, for a while, so that's that's great. Um, yes, I'm pointing to the pizza. The fine young oh, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Yes. Now we have fine young representatives out there from our talent acquisition. Um, Forrest has nudged me to do this now, but I was going to get to this later. Um, but they are out there in case you are looking for a new opportunity. Uh, please go and talk to them. Get some free swag. They have some fun pen pens with lights in them. I mean, um, but definitely go talk to them. Um, in addition, what do we have? Um, oh, some fun facts. I forgot to come up with another good fun fact. Um, this meetup uh, has official NBC pages, so Kenneth the Page from 30 Rock. That's pretty cool. That's who we have downstairs kind of helping everybody get up here. Um, and once the videos are um, recorded and Elijah plays with the sound, because that's what he does in his spare time, they will be uploaded from this meetup and every meetup onto drupal.myc slash videos. Watch this again. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you find something that's really interesting throughout the evening that you want to share with somebody, make sure that you send them that link so they can go and they can see the talk too. Um, what's that? And there will be Easter eggs in the t I don't know what he's talking about. OK. Um, <laughs> photos. Uh, please, if you take photos, that's encouraged. That's great. Um, the hashtag that we typically use is uh, hash Drupal NYC, all lowercase, no spaces, no dashes, no underscores. Um, and you know, put those up there. Um, also, you can upload the photos if you take any to the meetup page at meetup.com slash Drupal NYC. Um, as you can see, there's a really, um, there's an action shot here of somebody <laughs> taking pizza. Um, you can see Michael Myers in the background, right? That's pretty cool. Um, so we really, we have some great shots. Um, also, when you get a chance, when there's not talks going on, peek your head out the window and you get a pretty good view of the tree and the lights and everything before they take that down. Um, okay. Uh, upcoming events. So there's lots of events that are always going on in the Drupal community and related communities that we might like to, um, to point out to everybody. Um, the Drupal NYC Play Day. So this is something that happens every month. Um, this, is, um, this is kind of our super secret way of trying to help people kind of climb the ladder within the Drupal community a little bit. Um, so if you're a super beginner, it's a great place to go and become a little bit less of a beginner and a little bit more of an intermediate. If you're someone who's kind of intermediate, it's a great place to go and kind of move up to, to someone who's a bit more advanced. Um, uh, basically, a whole bunch of people show up. They play around with Drupal and other technologies. They talk to each other. There's usually, there's usually food, which I'm guessing is pizza at this point, um, because that's the only food we know how to order in the Drupal community. <laughs> um, um, but, well, because pizza, it's so versatile. It's kosher, generally. It's vegan sometimes, if you get it properly. It's got, it's got everybody covered. Anyway, um, uh, so please do participate in one of the, uh, the play days. The next one's coming up on uh, Saturday the 16th. Um, we do a happy hour once a month. This is where you know, everybody shows up, has a drink, you know, has some good conversation, talk about Drupal, talk about something else, whatever you like. Um, that's, you know, it's a, it's a fun time with good people. So please do show up to that. That's going to be the next one's on January 27th. That is typically the last Wednesday of every month. Um, but if you go to the meetup.com page, you'll always see it kind of listed there. Uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey is coming up uh, January 29th through 31st. Um, it's in Princeton. Um, Elijah is waving at me and making silly things. But would you, Elijah, would you like to say anything about Drupal Camp New Jersey? Oh. Hi, guys. My name's Elijah. Um, uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey is coming up. It sells out pretty quick, so get tickets still. I think there's still some tickets available. They always sell out every single year. So um, make sure to go that. It's a three-day kind of conference. Actually, I think it's five days. But the main day is Saturday, the 30th. It's uh, in Princeton University. Um, I submitted a talk. I'm up here. 
Um, I, I don't know if it's accepted yet. It's HTTP for noobs. Um, so if anybody's interested in learning about HTTP, go to that, and I have a, hopefully I get in. Hopefully you guys see me there, even if I don't speak. Thank you. So basically, Elijah was trolling for votes for his presentation. <laughs> so even if you're not going, go to the Drupal Camp in uh, New Jersey and uh, and vote for Elijah's talk. Forest, would you like to say something real quick? Everybody vote for my talk too. I didn't want him to just get all the votes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, that same weekend, I wanted everyone to know, if you can't make it to New Jersey Drupal Camp, that weekend is the first global sprint weekend uh, for Drupal. That it, thank you. Thank you for fixing the mic. Um, so that is wherever you are, uh, there's a hashtag and drop in IRC, and that is a big push to have everyone sprinting on Drupal code, no matter where you are, even if you can't make it to Drupal Camp. So look further. I don't think there's an announcement up on GDO yet on the New York group, but there should be shortly and make everyone, hopefully, see everyone online for that big Global Sprint Weekend 2016. Sounds good. Global Sprint Weekend. Excellent. Um, uh, also coming up is DrupalCon Asia. So if anybody wants to take like a, a day trip to Asia, um, that would be awesome. Uh, I actually know someone who did actually a day trip to Sydney, Australia from New York. That's insane, but someone did it. Um, but that's coming up in February. I, I don't remember where it is this year. I did look it up. Is it in Bangalore? It's in Mumbai? We have Mumbai. Do I, I hear Mumbai. Do I see uh, Calcutta? Calcutta? No, okay. Um, all right, so Mumbai, it sounds like, is the consensus. Uh, it, it's in Bombay. It's in Malibu. Um, that's in Asia, right? Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, the Titanic leaves from the west side. Okay, um, one last one that we have, and I think we have a slide about this that gives a little bit more information on the next slide, but I don't remember, so we'll talk about it right now. Um, Drupal Camp NYC 2016 is coming up. Drupal Camp is uh, our unconference, and usually um, we, we do this once a year, and I'm going to have uh, Ho Ling come up and, and give us a whole spiel about it. Hi, my name is Ho Ling. I'm the person who's been harassing all of you for like the last three or four months to come to meetups. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I'm here to harass you some more. I think it's the next slide. So Drupal Camp NYC is an all-day end conference. We have Drupal ladders. So anybody who's a beginner who wants to be intermediate or intermediate who wants to become an advanced developer, please attend the Drupal ladders. Um, we also have mentoring, and we also have Sprint. Um, but there is a Sprint room, so come. And it's on Saturday, February 27th at John Jay College. Um, the entrance is on 59th Street between 10th and 11th Avenue. Hello. Hi. <laughs> the registration fee is $20. Um, please register at uh, drupal.myc slash drupalcamp. And it's the same link for a corporate sponsor. After you hit the register button, um, you can either be an attendee or a different level of sponsors. There's also um, sponsor perks. Please check out the page. Thank you. Uh, so two, two quick notes. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an unconference is, not everybody has kind of been to one of those. An unconference is, um, or at least within our community, I've never actually been to an unconference outside of our community, but they're fun. Basically, everyone comes in the morning, and we kind of figure out the agenda for that day, that day. So some people come in and say, you know, I would really love to see a talk X, Y, or Z topic. Is there anybody around who can give a talk about X, Y, Z topic? Somebody who's around waves their hand and said, yeah, I know all about X, Y, Z. I'm going to give a quick talk about that at 2 o'clock in this room. Um, so we spend just a few minutes in the morning kind of figuring out some, some very loose parameters. Um, and, and then we, you know, we tweet that out to everybody, and, and we have a conference. Bless you. Um, so that's what an unconference is. Uh, so don't, don't come to an unconference expecting like a rigid agenda that's at this time there's this specific talk come to an unconference saying, I really want to know more about X, and I really want to kind of talk with other people about Y. Um, so go to a conference, or go to a session or, or a talk early in the morning and learn something new, and then later in the afternoon, you're the one that's sharing some other information about a different topic. Uh, so that's what an unconference is. Uh, secondly, I did notice on the, on the registration page, it's a little bit daunting. When you go to register for this, the button says $20 to like $1,200. Don't get scared, right? The twenty dollars is for is for the, the attending registration. The twelve hundred dollars is if you want to be like a, the gold sponsor. Um, but I noticed that, and I was like, twelve hundred dollars. I don't know that I really want to click on that so much. But but you can tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Okay. 
But that's true. If you do the $1,200, you do get five passes. So thank you, Scott. All right. So that's Drupal Camp NYC. Um, intro to Drupal's uh, presentation. So we're trying to get uh, a little bit better at uh, letting you know what kind of presentations we're going to be doing at this meetup uh, in advance. Um, so we're, we're kind of uh, uh, soliciting presentations now. Ben, uh, who's usually here, was not able to attend this evening. So I will just give the quick spiel. If you have a topic that you would like to speak about, please email Ben at jevins at gmail.com. If you cannot remember that, please find me and I will write it down on your hand or something. Uh, but I will make sure that Ben, uh, ben gets that information if, if you need to stay in touch with me or any of the other um, If you are looking for a talk on a specific topic, if there's something you'd really like to hear about, hey, I heard there's, there's this you know, new version of Drupal that came out. What does it do, right? You know, that's, that's the sort of information that we want as well. So if you have an idea for a talk, come on up. Let one of the uh, organizers know. We'll make sure that Ben knows, or you can you know, hit him up on email. Uh, he loves to get information about what people are looking for as much as he does you know, finding out that you're interested in giving a talk. Um, but this is a great way for, you know, for people to kind of share their experience, share the things, the challenges they've had. You do not have to be the world's leading expert in a technology or in a subject matter to give a talk on it. Um, it is perfectly wonderful when we get talks, and sometimes they're even better, when we get talks from people who are just kind of figuring out a particular you know, problem space, and they're going through, here's, here's the problem space that I'm trying to figure out, here are the things that I've figured out so far, here are the things that maybe I haven't quite figured out today. Um, those kind of you know, talks are terrific, and they really spark a lot of good conversations. So don't be shy if you have a topic that you want to talk about. That is my sales pitch on behalf of Ben Jevons. Um, I will put my... Alex hat back on and um, oh one other one other announcement from Ben Ben has been uh, putting together with the other organizers uh, a survey about this meetup just to find out how well we're doing what things we can improve what things we can the opposite of improve um, but I don't know that we'd want to do that but um, we are going <laughs> we are going to be sending that out to the participants in, in this meetup and, and past meetups uh, in the near future so if you see that come across your email Please do take the three minutes that it takes to fill it out. This benefits our whole group. So please, 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 please um, fill that out when that comes around. Um, uh, oh, Elijah would like to um, make an announcement about a volunteer. So I waited until he put a big piece of pizza in his mouth and then called him up here to talk about a volunteer opportunity for our community. Hi, guys. Elijah again. Um, so I, uh, we record the, these meetups. We started the first meetup here. We've recorded everyone since, which is awesome. We are um, 1080p, high definition. Um, and um, I record, I, I, in my kind of time, I, I edit them. And uh, we have to remove room noise right now because we actually record through a microphone to the ceiling speakers. Um, we're working on getting a live feed, and we don't have to do that. But, uh, anyway, from time to time, I'm looking for somebody who can edit the video like immediately after the meetup. Right now it takes me like, I haven't even finished last month because stuff came up. Um, but I'd like, ideally, I'd like the vision to be the next day. It's up, ready to go and send out. That way people have just attended, have energy, and they can tweet it out. Um, we record these in Apple ProRes codec, so I'm looking for somebody that's actually experienced, uh, more experienced than myself, uh, and has the ability to Apple edit Apple ProRes. If you don't know what that is, it's probably not for you. Um, experience filtering room noise, um, edit, upload each video to their YouTube channel. Nice to actually slice up each video into like a separate group of videos, um, so you could share it. In the, right now, we share links to the timestamps, but um, whatever. Um, anyways, talk to me, or if you know of anybody, please spread the word. I'd like somebody that's good and fast at this. Thank you. That's awesome, Elijah, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Awesome. Okay, so uh, this is something we added um, a little while ago at this point, but uh, real quick, who is looking to hire a Drupal developer or a Drupal person? Um, those of you who are looking to hire, would you mind standing up for one second and, and just giving us the, uh, the, the 15 second sales pitch? 15 seconds, quick. Um, I'm looking for a part-time um, front-end dev slash site builder of Barnard College. All right, we have one more right behind you. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm from ZipTech. We're in Philly. We do Drupal-y stuff and other stuff. 
with open source. We work on a lot of cool projects. Uh, we're about 30 people, and we're always looking to hire good devs. All right, awesome. Um, so uh, NBC, right? We have our, our NBC talent acquisition folks out there. We are always looking for great talent. Um, we're a totally fun place to work. Come talk to me. Come talk to our talent uh, acquisition folks in the back, and uh, and we we you could you could work for NBC. You could be in this building all the time. Um, okay, is what? what no, we're not really in this building. We're actually in Times Square, but thanks. Um, <laughs> but our badges work. You could be in this building whenever you want. It's cool. Um, okay, is anybody uh, is anybody looking to uh, be hired? Yes, I have. Well, I have one over here. I'm Spassin Shadal, and I'm uh, also uh, looking for uh, clients uh, or part-time, full-time employment, Drupal development, front-end, so I'll be looking for some of you out here. Thank you. Front-end development, looking for clients. Everyone take notes. Okay. Um, ooh, I don't have that. Um, okay, so a long time ago, we used to do introductions, and everybody would go around the room and say, hi, my name is, and I work for, and I do whatever, and it would take the length of the Bible for us to get through the entire thing. So instead, um, I am told, I wasn't able to be here the last couple times, but I'm told this has worked much better. Please take two minutes, three minutes, turn to your neighbor on your left, turn to your neighbor on your right, and introduce yourself. Hi, who are you? What is it that you do? What is it that you're interested in? Um, what sort of, uh, what, are your, what are your hobbies? What's an interesting story about yourself? Anything like that. Um, please just take two or three minutes and do that, and then we'll come back. How are you? What's your name? D. Nice to meet you. All right. How are you? I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Ahem. 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 Because we're going to keep going. But I, I, I hope that everybody met someone new. And everyone has a new friend now, right? Everybody has someone to talk to. Um, hopefully that was cool, right? Okay. Um, where's my little clicker here? So, uh, obviously, everybody's going to come afterwards and go to Bill's Bar, so you'll have plenty of opportunities to talk to the people you just met, as well as anybody that was on the other side of the room that you didn't have time for. Um, but here we go. All right, our first talk this evening uh, is going to be given by uh, Greg Lowenthal. Um, Greg comes to us from Acquia, I believe. Hold on, i got to look at my, my cheat sheet because I, I forgot. Um, yeah. He is presently a senior solutions architect at Acquia. He lives on Long Island with his wife and three cats. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about evolving your mobile site experience. Does that thing work? I think so. All right. Hey, guys, can you hear me? All right. Just talk. Okay. 
Hi everyone, yeah, my name is Greg Lowenthal. I'm with Acquia. I am new, I am new to Drupal. I've uh, been, been with Acquia for four, five, four or five months now. Uh, but I've been in the, in the tech space for years for content management. Uh, and also mobile optimization. So I'm going to talk a little very briefly about mobile optimization, specifically around uh, responsive 2.0 or REST uh, and, and why this is important. All right, great. So uh, everyone knows what responsive design is, right? Uh, and, and the problem with that is that it's become more than it really is. And it's really not the silver bullet that everyone really wanted to be. Because mobile was hard before, and we were making M dot sites, and we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And we said, well, you know, now it's easy because we have one code base, and uh, to create everything. But the problem is it's not the silver bullet. And uh, the problem is that it. Responsive design in itself is not a bad idea, but the problem is that the, the uh, implementation is not sound. And, and the, the reason is because it becomes this one-size-fits-all type of implementation. And, um, and what happens is that you know, you're focusing on screen sizes. And so you know, you're dealing with the widths and, and points, and you're dealing with, uh, with even you know, CSS, uh, different calls for flexible images, and, and in general to, to uh, to focus in on, on a looking good experience of that same desktop experience. But really, you know, uh, as I'm sure that you guys have been, have been experiencing, even as a normal user of mobile sites, there are shortcomings. And the biggest one is around performance. Because you ha you're basically putting every single possibility inside of your responsive code and then pushing it down to the client, uh, typically when they have a limited bandwidth, right? Uh, so like I'm on the train and I can't even understand. Uh, you know, I can't. I can't actually download a web page because it takes literally seconds, many seconds, to do that. And so, you know, if, if you look at some of the, the stats here, 86% of of a responsive uh, web design sites or regular responsive sites are sending the same assets down to to all the devices. And uh, and in general, that's a poor user experience because what that means is that is that you know half of us, more than half these days probably, we, we expect immediate immediate time. So you know, even though this is a small device and it's powerful, and but we expect this as an extension of our own entity, and it's our personal device that it should be, it should just happen, right? And uh, you know, I have bandwidth, and it should just happen, and that's that's a difficult thing to to really uh, to uh, surmount from a technological perspective, and uh, from a marketing perspective and a business perspective, this is really a problem because uh, because every second delay. Cost seven percent conversion, at, or two two point eight percent of your revenue on a marketing space. So if you're actually doing e-commerce or you're trying to get people to do something on your website and it's taking too long, they're just going to go into another website and it's your competitor. And, and also, uh, you know, the the idea is that since you're doing this one size fits all type of mentality, you're oftentimes trying to just do the same thing on your website that you are on on your mobile experience. User may not be in the same mindset. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, depending on their location, uh, or maybe, like I said before, their bandwidth or the battery life, uh, they they may want to um, have a different experience. Even from, you know, I'm walking down the street and I'm going to my banking site. What is what am I trying to do? Am I trying to look for a new credit card? No. So there are these these ideas about about what someone's trying to do on the mobile when they're mobile. With and interacting with your brand. In addition to that, they may want to uh, actually substitute performance for user experience uh, for versus quality, rather. So you may have experienced some websites asking you on your mobile site uh, when you get there, do you want a fast experience or do you want a quality, you know, a rich experience? Because a lot of this information, whether especially on the image and the video side, uh, it's very costly for them for, for, that, for that user. And uh, so, so you know, when I ask you then, you know, do you want to be screen size aware or do you want to be device aware, right? So, so if you think about the device context, not just the screen size, that's where we talk about what we call responsive uh, with server side components, and that's what's called REST in the market. And this is a this is a marriage of what used to be adaptive, like the M dot kind of site uh, idea of being able to focus in on just one experience for a mobile type of user, and and still using the responsive fluid nature of a. 
So what does that really mean? So responsive with server-side, in, in case you guys don't know what it means, it basically means using server-side elements to, to more easily package up what, you, what that device needs at, uh, at request time. So that you're not sending down every single option, the full HTML code, the full JavaScript, the full CSS, uh, e even with the media queries. Uh, you're still downloading a lot of extra code that only a fraction of that is, that device is going to use at a given time. So, so when we talk about responsive with server-side, it's about define, identifying what that device is. So firstly, getting a device detection. And then you basically do a set of feature detections. And then based on that, it will, it will download the right media and also the right functionality enabled for that device, as well as any sort of specific functions that you may be uh, wanting to leverage on that device. So that JavaScript for a specific type of, or format of video is going to only play or even get sent down to the device that it, that is even able to support that. So, you know, in a nutshell, you're still going to use responsive design from a design paradigm because that's still that's still true, but you want to be a little bit smart about that. You want to you want to be able to then focus in on what the pieces are downstream. So you use that device detection, use the feature detection, and then code specifically to those devices. So that then you can uh, you can only send down what you need those small packets the smaller packets information so that essentially what happens then is you get increased performance with a smaller smarter payload to your what to your actual so some uh, some device detection that I've either been involved with in the past uh, or have competed against as well you know there are there used to be more open source uh, you know the most popular ones out there have been Device Atlas and Warful. Uh, Warful recently, well, not so recently anymore, went uh, went paid. Although in general, a, a lot of them are not very expensive either to, to get. And, and there is there is a difference between between a device detection library that that is uh, is maintained over time and then one that is sort of lagging on because you want to make sure that you worry about you know, the future devices. You know what happens when you're dealing with a watch-based uh, paradigm and maybe you know. Smart TV or or some new new device, and uh, you know, and if you do a, a quick Google search on uh, on Drupal org or something like that, you, you'll find some integrations with things like Mobile Detect, as well as uh, Modernizer as well. Modernizer more on the feature detection side, but you know, it, it, these are just considerations to think about because there are tools out there that 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 are building these libraries, and it, beside and instead of instead of just using. The header information you you want to be having a richer uh, richer amount of information that then you can code against so that then you could build therefore a richer mobile. Uh, are there any questions in the? I have one. Um, so for a long time I've been I've been told like device device detection is bad like you don't want to do device detection you want to do feature detection okay right but device detection has always been you know like kind of a sacred cow. As I've learned it, okay. you don't do it because it, it's never up to date. It's never accurate. It's never going to know about every phone or every device and every whatever. Um, but it sounds like you're you're advocating differently. Uh, yeah. Well, so I, I was at at Napiscuits and I did uh, partner with Trilobus in the past as well. And I know that you know we got asked that question a lot. And that was it was really uh, you know when when we were doing device detection, we were getting the devices before. Even they went out into market because we had relationships with the manufacturers. So I think that that yes, if you're looking at maybe some of the open source examples, uh, that it may not be up to date. It's only as up to date as somebody putting stuff on there. But if it's someone's business to do that, then then they have those inroads into. Can into I the, can uh, I turn the question around a little bit sure. and say okay let let's say hypothetically that the device detection is perfect right it's 100 percent perfect. Sure. Is it necessary to, or why is it necessary to detect the device if you can detect the features, right? Well, I guess it's a good question, and it depends on what you want to be doing. Um, I, what happens is a lot of the device detection will happen on the server side. So if you if you can cut if you have a server side feature, then that's fine. A lot of that a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the feature detection happens on the client side. So uh, so if you want to carve out the largest portion of JavaScript and everything that you're downloading, then the device detection is going to get you the biggest bang for your buck for that. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, I didn't hear clearly, but it might be a repetition of what being asked. So, my question is, yeah, if you so you know, JavaScript will be like if Apple iOS eight, then the display code. If Android, then the display code. If it's a web uh, computer and laptop, that's how it is implementation. Um, it's it's it may be more more granular than that. Uh, so you'll be on the on the feature side. You're going to be you're going to be uh, t saying if this feature is supported, then do this. As opposed to, to if iOS do this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. So, um, how does this work with caching strategies? So that's a good question. So, you mean like CDNs or? Uh, uh, yeah, CDN or even a varnish. Uh, how does that handle a device specific request? Or does it cache or not cache? Pass through? So, um, in my experience, uh, at least with the device detection, the, there, there needs to be integrations with the CDN to, to, under, to have multiple caches for each of the responses. And so you know, I've, seen, I've seen that done with Akamai with, a, with like a unique keys for each one. So it does differentiate that. But you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, hey, uh, this is Scott. Um, yeah, uh, my, to follow up on that real quick, and then I have a, another question. What, what we had done in the past was have different cache buckets per device um, because it was a requirement. But again, that's. In my experience, that's not really a very good requirement. That's more that should be more of a solution to whatever the requirements are. Um, and so that kind of leads into my question: is why, why wouldn't? Uh, again, uh, maybe it's following up on a similar thing to what Alex said. It's it's more of, in my mind, I keep thinking: well, make make pages for every, or make responses for every device be 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 fast. You know why why if someone has a large device, um, should it then be heavier? Why if the content's important? Why not present it in different ways? And I think that's the, the tr it's not even traditional at this point, but it's, um, it's the approach that front-end advocates have been advocating for for a while. And I guess why, why, would, why is this a better solution? Why, why, is, why is presenting larger packets to larger devices a better solution than making it fast for everyone? That's, my, that's a probably a better summary. Well, I think I agree with you that that uh, especially with the with the increase of in general bandwidth of the internet and everything like that, and with in general usage uh, the the amount of size of of uh, hard drives and um, memory that that coding has gotten sloppy and lazy. It can you know I remember writing DOS commands and trying to fit it as small as possible, <laughs> and uh, because that was important, right? And now it, it's become not not important for. Uh, but I think that it, it has become important again on the web. And even though we have all this great bandwidth, that a lot of times you don't get the full bandwidth. And your batteries are dying, and you just want your information. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that, though, the problem is most pronounced on the smaller mobile devices. But as you know, our laptops are basically mobile devices as well. And, uh, you know, and even with the interaction point, you know, everything's going to be touch screen if it isn't already. And you're going to still have you're going to have that same problem uh, with, with the larger devices. It's just that we're seeing that more. And but I think that I, I agree with you that that the device detection is not only for mobile. Maybe because it is mobile because there's you know literally tens of thousands of mobile device uh, parameters out there uh, globally, and, uh, and there are considerably fewer parameters when you or or, or options when you talk about uh, desktop devices. You know the um, complexity there actually. So there's just fewer options, um, but I think it means that too. It means smart TVs, you know. Also, so how responsive design, the paradigm, you're going to have to think about, you know, uh, what am I going to be doing at each of those at each of those touch points, and and it doesn't need to be necessarily heavy, but you, but it needs to be richer experience, at least more things, right? You don't want something to look like just a stretched out version of your mobile site either. Uh, this is going to be the, the last question to Forrest. Make sure. Last question. We still have like an hour. <laughs> well, we still have two more talks that we yeah, have to get yeah. to. Um, so wasn't the web originally designed, though, to 
uh, allow devices to request data sets that were specific to them, you know, acceptable, acceptable content. And if so, I mean, are we doing kind of an end run here or are we just like rewriting it or are we using that? I mean, if we, are, we, are we not using that implementation and we're just saying forget that? Or does this connect at all to, you know, the original idea of, you know, the RESTful web where a device said, this is, this is the content that I will accept based on my device. And so to me, it sort of like feels like it will make sense. Like, wait, we have the standard to do this. And they're like, so it would be like if someone, you know, came up and, you know, told you what they were, you know, what they were, was acceptable to them. You're like, well, hold on. Hold on there. Maybe let me figure this out for you. You're like, well, I just told you. So, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure uh, about that. I, I do know that that the that the Rev One of Responsive had sort of trod on all of that because it's basically shoving down everything down in, into the device and letting the device figure it out for 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 itself. But it's it's sort of like like the. Uh, I feel like it's it's almost uh, it's almost akin to the email problem. It's like, well, we had emails on on uh, Pine, you know, in Unix, and then you have emails in Google, and you have emails in Outlook, and and how do all these uh, how does that richness come out, um, or or not, and how should it get requested or not, and uh, if there are uh, if if that's what the intention was originally of the web, I think that we we've we definitely strayed away from that, and this is a way of maybe even band-aiding that if there is some foundational way of coming back to that truth. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Greg, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, if you have more questions for Greg, you're going to come to Bill's bar later, and hopefully Greg is coming also. Um, yeah, oh, no, he's got to go out to Long Island, so catch him before he leaves. Wait till we get a video feedback, though. Okay. Sorry, I'll go for a few more seconds till the slides are up. Uh, but we have a new guidebook that is uh, almost done. It should be done sort of late this month, early next month. That gives you sort of a walkthrough of how to do media. A lot of progress and essentially just building on the work that Aaron Winborn uh, did in New York. Um, anyways, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Willie. Awesome. Uh, look at that, a surprise presentation. Fantastic. Um, okay. My. Okay. Um, okay. Chris, we're we're ready to go. Okay, cool. All right. So, hi. I'm Mai. Um, I'm a senior developer at Phase Two Technology, and uh, I'm going to share with you what uh, Robbie Holmes, or as he's known everywhere as Robbie the Geek, um, told me all about uh, when we were chatting about pair programming some time back. And um, I'm certainly not a teammate expert, but uh, I thought it was pretty, a pretty neat tool, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us, a lot of you guys have experienced this type of problem when developing. Uh, basically, you have a team of developers. They're happily coding, working together in harmony, and then one of them has a problem. Um, and uh, you know, you start troubleshooting. Um, you know, using your chat messages or whatever. And, and this is the problem where, like, this is not working on my local dev environment. Um, a lot of, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that kind of issue. And, uh, sorry, I lost my slides. Okay, and then you kind of pass back and forth snippets to try and, like, figure out the problem, the solution to the problem. And no, no, it's not working. Um, and you pass back errors, or maybe you don't pass back the whole error, and it's like uh, none of this kind of like makes any sense. So then, you know, it's time to escalate this troubleshooting to some kind of video conferencing solution, maybe like a Hangout or Skype or something, something that allows screen sharing so you can see what's going on. But unfortunately, screen sharing kind of always looks like this. You know, somebody's sharing their whole desktop or they're sharing their terminal, and you're just like, Okay, um, try this. Okay, try this command. What if you type that and you're squinting at it? And it's just like, oh, it's so hard to see and try to figure out what's going on. And at this point, you really just want to type it out yourself instead of just dictating and squinting. 
and it just it's very inefficient. Um, it's a very frustrating experience uh, a lot of times, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about like how maybe teammate might be able to kind of come to the rescue. So, um, teammate is a fork of Tmux, and I'll talk about that in in a sec. But uh, basically, they can coexist on the same system. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is how Teammate can give you the power of sharing your terminal. So what's Tmux? So Tmux is, is a terminal multiplexer. Um, it's, it's, uh, so basically, it gives you, gives you a lot of things. But uh, some things that you can do is you can switch easily between uh, several programs in a single terminal. Sorry, I, have, I forgot to put a space between single and terminal. Attach them and keep, you know, your programs running in the background. You can reattach them to a different terminal and so much more. There's uh, the link to GitHub I/O uh, page, and there's also a book that's free that gives you all the details. But uh, it's really great if you have a script that runs for a long time and you want it to run in the background, or you want to be like super efficient dev and be like switching between your database console and your web server and whatever, you know. Um, it gives you all these tools, but let's get back to Teammate. So once you have it, Teamux is amazing. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, so once you have Teammate uh, installed, it's pretty simple to uh, to to use it. Uh, basically, you just type Teammate, and uh, you get this nice connection string at the bottom that you can share with your team member. Um, and because it's based on Teamux. Uh, you can use all your configuration and et cetera there. But uh, this, you have the option of sharing a read only or a read write session. So by default, um, you can, you're can you sharing a read write session. That's what that orange bar at the bottom, that connection string is. But if you want to share a read only string, uh, basically what you do is you start a teammate session and then you can use teammate show dash messages you get this read-only connection string that you can share. And as you can see in the help message, it says to clear your screen because right underneath it is a read-write connection string. And if you're sharing your terminal, your teammate is going to see that read-write uh, connection string. So yeah, clear it. Um, there's also an HTML client um, in progress. However, the client has some, some problems with some of the key bindings. Um, or Tmux, and there are some known graphical errors. And we're talking about terminal sharing. So use a terminal, not, not the HTML client. I mean, unless you want to fiddle around with it or whatever. So some other benefits uh, that terminal sharing can give you is pair programming. And this was the whole kind of beginning of how I learned about Tmate when I was talking with, about it with Robbie. So, Remote pair programming is pretty straightforward with Teammate. Uh, basically, you just need a good headset with a mic. You'll still want to jump on Hangout or Skype or use a phone or whatever so you guys can uh, talk verbally. You start up Teammate, share that read-write session with your um, team member, edit in Vim, and celebrate. You're like knocking down tickets left to right. Um, one person can be the driver. And uh, the other person can be the navigator. So how do you install this? On Mac, uh, you can use Homebrew. You just tap the formula and install it. If you're using something like Ubuntu, you can get the packages and install it. You can also uh, install it from source after you uh, get your dependencies. Uh, I think it has to be on, same, same thing for the server, which I'll talk later. But this has to be on Linux if you're doing from source in this for this particular thing. But um, anyway, there's some straightforward kind of scripts that kind of make this process a little more seamless. Um, so let's get back to like, how does this all work? Like, this all sounds very magical. Um, so when you launch Teammate, uh, an SSH connection is established to teammate.io. And it's a little, it may be a little small in this diagram, but this, this part here is teammate.io. Um, and uh, basically, it's established uh, to 
teammate.io, or you could do it to you know your own server, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but in, it's it, the the connection is happening in the background through the SSH. The client, your Tmux client, is authenticated um, with your local SSH keys. Um, and when the connection is established, a session token is generated, and um, the Tmux server is spawned in a jail, so that uh, with no file system and its own PID namespace, so that you know it's isolated from other processes and it doesn't have any user privileges either, just as like a safety precaution. So um, when you give the uh, connection string to your teammate, um, what happens then when they when they connect is uh, basically Tmux Unix socket is um, looked up on the file system, and if there's a match, then we've got a new Tmux client spawned and connected to the remote Tmux server. In this case, that's teammate.io in this diagram. Okay, so I bet a lot of you guys are like, oh my god, I work on client work. I cannot be like sharing my terminal through some kind of third party server. My stuff is, needs to be protected. Well, you can host your own teammate um, server. And there's a repo there, it's teammate-slave. Um, this has to be installed on Linux. Um, so after you get all your dependencies and you install it, basically you need to set up uh, your configuration file. And then you can start your server um, with this teammate-slave command after you pass, you know, you'll pass in your uh, parameters like the port, host, and et cetera. Okay, so there's additional information out there on hosting your own teammate server um, on teammate.io. There's a Docker instance, and there's an install guide um, also out there, and there's probably more documentation, um, but these are some ones that I found. Um, so let's go back to our scenario from before. Okay, so back to when our dev was saying that something wasn't working on his local dev environment, and he's getting some kind of error. Um, you can still, you know, jump on a call, you know, whatever video conferencing, some kind of hangout or Skype or whatever, but instead of sharing your screen and dictating kind of commands, you can share your terminal instead and kind of work together. And, uh, you know, it's, it can be potentially more efficient um, and, and less frustrating. And, you know, you can be... Um, I don't know what happened to this slide. But, huh. And you can solve problems um, and, and be happier. So there are some additional resources here. Um, there is a link to the GitHub. There is also a uh, channel on IRC and a Google group. So thanks. Yay. Does, it, does anybody... Does anybody have any questions for my... Yes, we have one right here. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I can answer this myself with 30 seconds of research, but what the hell? Um, can I open my currently saved Tmux sessions in Teammate? Yeah. I love questions like that. Those are the best questions. Yes, moving on. Any other questions? I have a question. It says that you can edit the files in um, VIM. Does it also support Emacs and Nano, et cetera? Yeah, 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 you could do Emacs. Um, I haven't tried Nano, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think you could, yeah. Okay. We're going to go with yes. Um, is it secure? Define secure. <laughs> if I went to a client of mine who would be a very large bank, would they check off on it? Oh, the bank? No, you did not <laughs> check on that. Uh, unless you were like hosting your own teammate server. But yeah, there is like this guy like uh, who, you know, wrote this uh, this application and everything. He has like a research paper and everything to explain, you know, all the security considerations he uh, thought through um, in terms of like trying to make it as secure as possible, considering that you are sharing, you ha are giving somebody access to like delete all the files on your system once you share your terminal. All right, any other questions? 
Is this just text-based sharing? You are not able to see the other computers, user graphic icons or apps, something, right? Right. It's just it's just your terminal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but but given that, you can literally see anything that terminal has access to. Yeah. Not graphically, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Mai. I, I, I do question. appreciate. Oh, one final question. Yeah. Um, what kind of permissions is the person you're sharing your terminal with have? Is it the same permissions as you? Because if you're running it as root, yeah, uh, yeah. that so could be a problem. If they know your password, um, if for you know, if you want to switch to root, then yeah, it's it's as if they went to your computer and started typing on your laptop. So if they know you know your passwords and stuff, and they can you know have root access, it's the same thing. Yeah. So share wisely, my share friends. Wisely. Share wisely. Share um, wisely. I would like to point out that all of the various like video uh, gifts that were shown there were all NBC properties. So thank you, Mai, for that. Um, that was awesome, right? Because Bravo is an NBC property, and so is uh, NBC, obviously. Um, OK, so while we get set up with the mic up here um, and get ready for Eugene, um, real quick, I am going to, when Eugene starts, I'm going to step outside into the lobby over there. So if anybody wants to join my newbie boff and ask me questions about anything fun and exciting, or not fun or not exciting, uh, you will find me right outside those doors in the lobby where you came in by the elevator. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Eugene as Roddy. Um, Eugene, well, I have, I have notes. I uh, spent 15 years as a technologist in industries, including digital media, cloud computing, and reputational marketing. Uh, holds dual degrees in mathematics and computer science, slacker, um, and a master's degree in computer science and engineering, definitely slacker. Um, Eugene is the co-founder and CTO of the MyTalk group, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, a uh, web development studio that focuses on enterprise applications and platforms. So Eugene is going to talk to us about um, um, microservice architectures and using uh, Amazon Lambda. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are we good with the mic? Uh, hello? Hmm. <laughs> Rockefeller Center. <laughs> Rockefeller Center was built. In, you know. um, I actually did look it up. That, that first, that very first meetup here, we had a lot of technical difficulties, and I, I kept saying over and over it was 1939, but it wasn't. It was like 19, it was like 1934 or something. Um, I, I can say that the um, the original Rockefeller Center Christmas tree was exactly where the rink is now. And it was like 12 feet tall. It was like a minuscule, who cares, Christmas tree that the like, construction workers put up when they built the building. Um, I can also tell you that the famous photo of all the guys sitting up on like the 80th floor of a building just eating lunch on a big, you know, that, that's this building. So while the, the construction workers were building this building, they, I, I hope they finished their lunch right now. Or they're still up there. Who the hell knows? Uh, uh, Willie has another announcement for us. Come on down. This is, this is a really quick service announcement, because um, Alex and the rest of the team are probably too humble to say anything. But I just want to say uh, thanks to MBCU for hosting. I think the last like meetup since it's been here has just been awesome, like super impressive. And I think what the team has been doing has been awesome. And the fact that they're recording everything and getting it online and stuff. So I just want to say thanks personally. And like, if the rest of the room feels the same way, you need to give it a It's really, really awesome. Thanks so much. Um, no, thank you. Um, in, in truth, like N NBC has been doing, you know, has been really generous to to our group, right? The larger NBC, they don't know what the hell we're doing here. And they just said, you know, okay, um, we'll we'll get involved in this. So they've been great. Um, but in terms of the quality of the of the the, the meetup, that's really been the, the the people who've been kind of running the show. So thank you, of course, to all of them. Um, yeah, yeah, my and Chris and Elijah really, you know. Um, and Ben, I've, I've really jumped into it at first. I'm, I'm technically an organizer, but in truth, this is what I do. So I get to be an organizer, but I really just get to screw around right up here. But you're probably not going to be able to do the demo, um, right? Oh, I thought they were telling us that we were good to go. No, OK. Um, what else is there to discuss? Hmm. Do, 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 do. 
I got nothing. Like, I'm like, totally drawing a blank. Everybody knows that Drupal 8 is out, right? Every DrupalCamp.nyc. That is the URL for Drupal Camp. Yeah, let's try. Did I say that wrong earlier? No, Got it. Really oh, so thank you, Scott. So apparently, the Drupal Camp website, the official Drupal Camp website, uh, launched today, and that's DrupalCamp.nyc. Um, I know that was a big project that was pushed by by Bloomberg no, for a while, just to get .nyc to be a real thing. So that's cool. The link will be up on the Twitter feed. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. This is good because I I I'm, I usually can like vamp Just on stuff. Regarding the really the camp that's coming up at the end of February, so the Drupal Camp NYC. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody had a question online asking whether there'd be Drupal eight and assistance, and so we're going to have. There's like a sprint and sort of contribution room where you can come and get help, and I'll be one of the volunteers there helping, and I'm assuming there'll be some others as well. So if you want to get set up on Drupal 8 and get your local development environment going, that'll, that'll definitely be possible. So. Awesome. Also, I'll be doing at that camp, um, I'm like 99% sure, I'll be doing uh, the kind of like newbie training. You know, concepts in Drupal. What, when we all talk about nodes and entities, what the hell are we talking about? That kind of good information. Um, I'll definitely um, be doing a, a session on that. And we also we have uh, NYC camp okay. coming up again, nice camp in uh, July. Um, so maybe more announcements coming, but um, we're working on that. So if someone wants to get involved and volunteer, um, you can catch me or some of the other organizers here too. So, All right. Say. Here we think we go. Eugene, what's going on? Do we got it? Do we got it? Come on, Elijah, make make magic, make it work. Okay. So who's going to Bill's bar later? More hands, hands, hands. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Oh, here we go. We're good. This is you. Yes, that looks just like you and your family. I know them all. I've known them for years. Okay. <laughs> all right. Sorry for the delay. And anyone again going to the newbie bath? Come on and come find me. All right. Um, well, hello, everybody. And thank you for coming here. Uh, sorry for the delay. My name is Eugene Strade. Uh, OK. Um, feel very humble and honored to be here today to talk about microservices architecture. Um, microservices, the more I dive into microservices, the more it reminds me of the joke that uh, every program can re be written in one line of code that has a bug. Well, I hope my presentation is, uh, is better than my jokes. So <laughs> this talk is actually an evolution and it evolved in time and emerged from a talk that I had last year at the AWS reInvent conference, uh, talking about microservices architecture for digital platforms, using Lambda, CloudFront, DynamoDB, and others. So the problem is the fundamental goal of every web application is to be up and running 24-7. Right? Uh, but it's a huge challenge to do that at scale. Uh, it recently happened to BuzzFeed when they published this article that went, vi that went viral. Uh, it recently happened to BuzzFeed, um, sorry, BuzzFeed. It recently happened to New York Media when they had been attacked and hacked by, by an individual. And it, hacked to, it happened to Flipkart uh, when they launched an exclusive uh, smartphone, low-cost smartphone, and that exclusive launch went, uh, um, went badly. Um, if anyone uh, heard of a GitHub, been attacked by supposedly Chinese uh, for the last couple of months, couple of times actually. Yeah. So, is there is a hand if uh, you had similar or you had the situations where your application went down because something like uh, no, nobody. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm like, wow. I'm sorry. I thought that I'm in the wrong room. 
Anyway, uh, it happened also to me um, back in 2009 when Michael Jackson died. And uh, uh, by that time, I was working in media as well as the agency. And uh, the, um, the breaking news actually brought down all of our websites, affecting 17 customers and 51 websites. So that was an unpleasant conversation with my manager. Well, um, it's a big concern that an overwhelming 87% of these kind of attacks affect customers. The average downtime costs us hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars per hour, not to mention damages in reputation and credit rating, um, customer churn, and insurance increases. Right? So is there something really easy that we can do in order to solve this problem fundamentally? I'll try to convince you that it is. We'll see. Uh, we've been doing it for a while, helping customers like uh, developers or architects, uh, technical or non-technical, business owners or decision makers. Uh, we've been helping everybody to, uh, to build resilient web applications. So that is how we ended up in building a, a platform as a service that we call Digital Enterprise End-to-End -end Platform. My name is Eugene Estrade. I'm the CTO and the partner at Mitel Group. Been in IT for 15 years, last seven years me using AWS and cloud computing generally. I'm a certified solution architect and I work in uh, companies like Hearst Corporation, Amazon Web Services, Grubhub, and Tenari. Michael Group is a web development studio that focuses on uh, enterprise applications and platforms. Uh, we are official AWS technology partner and most of our customers are media and entertainment companies. So, my presentation today is focused on may, three major topics. Serverless infrastructure, microservices architecture, and content management applications with some hands-on examples. Okay. So today I would like to, I would like to show you hands-on uh, the value of microservices. Uh, at the end of this talk, I will try to build or show you some of the steps in, from our development process, how we um, uh, run different applications, develop and run them in production. Um, and I took, I pick up a very small example. Uh, this is inspired from todonbc.com and we've built with the, the infrastructure, with the process that, uh, that I'm trying now to convince you guys if you would like to uh, apply it in your, um, in your in your process. So, sorry, I'm a little bit <laughs> getting nervous. Um, so the initial provisioning it takes a little bit of time. So at the beginning, right now, I'll go to the terminal, I'll fire up the process because it takes it might take even 20 minutes, and uh, I'll spend the rest of the time trying to explain and then show you uh, uh, three examples. Okay. All right. So my first step. Oh. Here is to go to microservices to do app. Okay, so what I'm uh, sorry, do you guys hear in the back, or should I increase a little bit of font? Make it bigger. All right, do it better. Okay, so. Uh, all these steps, they're actually documented, and I'll point you out. Um, most of the stuff that I'm talking here is open source. You can uh, take a look anytime after the presentation, as well as I'll point out to uh, the slides that I'm having loaded on SlideShare, and I have some videos that are loaded on YouTube, uh, that after that, uh, everything that I'm doing, you'll be able to take a look. And I'll try to post on meetup.com uh, on, the, on the event uh, page everything that I'm doing right here, okay? So, um, TP5 deploy service. 
Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the source. So it's also suggestive what happens right now. It takes the, uh, this application. The application is combined from uh, what we are calling two micro applications. And the micro applications have six microservices. Uh, right now, I want to start it deploying to production, and then I'll switch back to the presentation. Okay, so if you don't understand anything right now, don't worry. Uh, that's why uh, the, uh, the goal of this presentation is to explain you step by step um, until the end. Okay. Um, so, what is the reference architecture for for web application? Um, by show of hands, let's see how many of you are using something like this or something similar. 3T architecture, front end, back end, database, right? So without going into too much details, um, on AWS, if you're using multiple availability zones, which it means actually every availability zone is a different physical data center, that's why the from a scalability standpoint of view, uh, this and any application that you run in such an architecture scales in minutes. But if you have experienced breaking news or viral content or some attacks on your infrastructure, scaling in minutes is just not enough. Right? We personally, for our application, had to build additional complexity in order to be able to support and to mitigate those kind of problems in real time and in less than uh, just minutes, right? It should be seconds, sometimes even milliseconds. Using this architecture, especially on AWS, makes it makes the application actually to be maintainable and easy to support, right? Less operations makes the, the actual application less complex. But you still need experienced DevOps engineers to do so. Right? Um, as developers, we can choose whatever technology stack we would like to use. Either it's PHP or Python, Java or Scala, um, Go or C Sharp, and JavaScript or JavaScript. I understand you guys tired. <laughs> Me too. But we still had to recruit and to find skilled engineers that will be able to build and support the entire stack. Our, and it happens almost all the time, the only person who build application is the one that will be able to solve the problems at scale. Last but not the least, of course, this architecture is cost effective if we are implementing it properly. So we are paying only for resources that we are using. It's kind of part of cloud computing. But when the infrastructure doesn't scale fast enough, the engineering teams usually over provision to solve the short term problem and buy themselves time until they figure out the long-term solutions. Right. Please raise your hand if you've done it before. Yeah, <laughs> of course, all the time, right? <laughs> That's the beauty when you're dealing with non-technical people. Uh, you can do that. So don't tell my boss, but I did it as well. Oh, shit, this is an <laughs> <laughs> Um Just kidding. So while we were trying to solve all these problems for our applications, two major events happened that changed everything. Two years ago, back into 2014, Amazon launched AWS Lambda. It's an event-driven computing service for dynamic application. And last year at New York Summit, AWS launched Amazon API Gateway. It's a fully managed service for scalable API endpoints. So these two services enabled us to completely reinvent the, serverless arch the reference architecture into a serverless approach. 
So let's see what is this serverless approach. Let's dive deeper into serverless infrastructure. So first of all, what does serverless mean? Well, intuitively, you take a look, you think it has something to do with no servers. And it is. Generally speaking, the key concept is that developers don't need to deal with the servers. Right? They, to keep an, them up and running, especially at scale. Right? As a developer, you get a service and that is by, by, the, by design, it's highly scalable, it's highly secure, highly available, uh, it's pre-provisioned, so you don't need to worry about the infrastructure that you won't have servers at some point, and it's, um, and you pay only for what you use. But you don't have the, the problem that I mentioned earlier, that you need to provision way too much, right? So the main question that I'll try to answer here is how do we transform our applications that use the reference, uh, uh, the reference architecture into a serverless one? So let me show you how we did it for our applications, step by step, layer by layer. So I'll explain it layer by layer. So the first one, how can we transform the web tier from uh, into a serverless one. Right. Most of people actually, uh, let me pause here and ask how many of you have used AWS before? Very good. Uh, keep your heads up. How many of you used EC2? Okay. How many of you have used S3? How many of you, of you have used the web static, uh, um, static website hosting feature in S3? Okay, that's where I'm trying to go. So most of people think of S3 as a storage service available over the internet. But I personally uh, surprised that um, majority doesn't know that you can use S3 as a web server that is by, uh, by design, it's behind load balancers. And the only trick is that they don't have server-side scripting module enabled. So it is, uh, uh, it is uh, secure through identity and access management, AWS IAM service, and there is no need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. So as we're doing this transformation, uh, the static component stays exactly the same as in the reference one. So what we're doing, we're loading everything in S3 and exposing it through CDN um, CSS, JavaScript, documents, images, videos. And additionally, we take also HTML and loading into S3, which usually is served by the EC2, by the compute service. So, because um, S3 doesn't allow server-side scripting, we are forced or we are privileged to be using client-side languages like JavaScript for dynamic interactions, for dynamic functionality. Right? So modern JavaScript frameworks like AngularJS, they caught up a lot lately to other frameworks. Like, I don't want to go into details if Drupal is a framework or a platform, but I'll say Drupal. I'll say Symfony, Django, Rails, and so on. And they are very friendly with search engines, right? allowing indexing of old content or uh, old application, legacy application, as well as new application. But the biggest benefit, it is completely serverless. It means that the infrastructure comes pre-scaled at AWS size, which is virtually infinite. So, I've heard some people saying, and I'll quote, you will reach your budget faster than AWS will reach its physical limits. And uh, the bigger it is, the better it gets, and the lower it costs. I know, just a side note, uh, Amazon announced yesterday a new cut price 
that is takes 5% to 10% from their compute servers. And they can do it because they do it at scale. Right? So going to the app tier, how can we transform the app tier into a serverless one? And these are the two new services that I mentioned before. Right? So AWS Lambda can roughly be described as a Docker container on steroids. It runs Node.js or Java or Python. So those are the three languages that support it right now. But there are promises from Amazon that they are trying or they are looking to support additional languages as well. So, uh, yes. I know S3 is static, but I think that if you combine S3 with Lambda, I think you might get a dynamic web server out of it. Am I correct? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to just, and I'll show you too. <laughs> um, so Lambda, it deploys the code in milliseconds and executes code in seconds. Right? So like the web tier, it is uh, secure through IAM, Identity and Access Management, and there is no need to worry about underlying infrastructure. So because of the way Lambda is designed, we get out of the box an accelerated backend that has a very short time to live. We are writing small functions, loading them into Lambda, and executing them or uh, making calls, RESTful API calls, through API Gateway. You can make calls directly to Lambda, but it's not a RESTful API. It's just a self-signed URLs. Uh, and, but besides that, uh, if you do that, you need to think about caching, uh, metering, versioning, and throttling, which API Gateway provides you out of the, out of the box. So, and like in case of the web tier, Again, it is completely serverless. Right? Last but not the least, have a question? On the last slide at the top, it says uh, write in uh, Node.js at the accelerated back end. Yeah, there. This one? Yeah, and um, that's what I've seen before that it takes Node.js. And then just a minute ago, you were mentioning um, Python. Yes. As well? Is that yes. So um, when I started, good catch. Thank you. I will update it. Uh, when we started using this, it was only Node.js. Lambda, uh, Java, and Python. Java was added a little bit six months ago, more or less. And Python was added literally three months ago, the reInvent. Actually, two months ago. Good catch. I'll update my slides. Thank you. Um, so last but not the least, the database tier. Um, we encourage everyone to use DynamoDB because it, the only thing you as a developer need to think about is reads per second and writes per second. That's it. Right. Uh, and like in case of the both web tier and app tier, you are securing uh, DynamoDB through IAM, Identity and Access Management, and there is no need to worry about underlying infrastructure. So DynamoDB is a NoSQL database, right? It's amazing, schema-less, key value pairs, like MongoDB or CassandraDB, if you, anyone used those databases. Uh, we only have to think or increase or decrease reads or writes, but independently from each other. Uh, but at scale, by itself, DynamoDB could be very cost intensive. So what we did, we virtually put SQS in front of DynamoDB uh, and store the data sets into the queue. So SQS is a queuing service, and we store some of the data sets into the, uh, the queue that later asynchronously gets offloaded to DynamoDB. Obviously, this is not an example for, this is not a use case for all of our examples, only for eventual consistency, where we can afford eventual consistency. Okay. So um, 
I think it was Shazam mobile app that recognizes music around you, video. Uh, they were the first one to blog about this. And they said it saved them 50% of their database costs. Okay. So, and guess what? It is completely server. Right. Keep repeating, but it is, that's this idea. Um, but if you are not comfortable with a, a NoSQL no databases or you have legacy that you need to use relation databases, uh, our next choice is RDS Aurora. Uh, that it's a relational database fully managed. Uh, you have to worry about the scalability there. Um, but it comes, again, preloaded up to 34 terabytes, I think, of, sp of storage space. And you have to think of what types of uh, database do you want, how much memory, uh, CPU, virtual CPU, and so on. Yes? Just a quick question. Is uh, DynamoDB interoperable with uh, Mongo? Or like, what are the costs of trying to adapt something that's built for Mongo to use DynamoDB? Uh, so generally speaking, um, DynamoDB is closer to Cassandra than to Mongo. But most of the use cases, you can use exactly the same as you use Mongo. Um, and there are libraries that, um, so you can use it as a, either as a document store, or you can use it as a um, raw JSON that you pump into DynamoDB. The only thing that you need to respect the structure, it's not just dump everything. You need to compound the specific DynamoDB structure as the only inconvenience. Okay, I hope you guys are excited enough for me to show you the first demo of the day, how to set up a serverless infrastructure for your web application. And in this demo, I'll try to go from scratch, go into my AWS account, and I'll create all these services. I hope it will take me five, 10 minutes or more. And I'll load this to-do application that I already have the codes prepared and I'll try to show you how it loads using this entire infrastructure. Uh, again, uh, the provisioning the provisioning of uh, CloudFront, which is the content distribution network, CDN, takes up to 20 minutes. Oh, sorry. So the provisioning of the CDN takes up to 20 minutes. So if I'm if it's not ready, I'll try to show it from directly from S3 link. Okay. So let's go back and let's find where is my browser? Let's see, can I use it? Okay. So the first step uh, is identity access management. Uh, for this presentation, um, I won't create all the policies that needs to be created. And you already can see here that there are a couple of policies that uh, our automated process generates. Uh, I will create only one that needs to give access to Lambda, make calls to DynamoDB. Without that, it won't work. So I'll call demo Lambda. Dynamo DB. Selecting Lambda as a service, and there are predefined policies that you can, uh, can choose. Dynamo. So I need the one that does the invocation. Great. I'm done. This is the security that I have to worry about. That's it. Um, and I'll talk about this benefit at the end. Next step, I need to go to S3. And for those of you who used S3, right, I have to create the bucket. Let's see, demo to do app and specify the region. Because as I mentioned, you need to enable the static website hosting that's how the code, the JavaScript, will be able to make. Uh, and that's how you will be exposing it through CDN. So 
index html error html save um, in dynamo in uh, s3 you need to allow to give access so by default it's denied right so i need to if i load all my files i need to uh, make those files public but there is sorry of course yeah that's a lot of people are doing of course <laughs> Um, there is a better way, right? Um, you create the bucket policy, and I just click on the example. So everything that I'm doing right now, as I said, it, it's available on YouTube. But I'll just get the from the sample, put it policy, and I'll just change uh, the demo to do app. And that way, I don't need to worry about the, the credentials because this is a public bucket and I can upload here everything. Okay, so I need to do AWS front end and load everything that is here. Oh, this is, sorry, I need to enhance Um, so in order not to go folder by folder, um, AWS provides this Java applet. You can select here all and start uploading. And that's basically I'm done with the front end. Right? Actually, I'm um, sorry. Uh, I'm done with the storage service, but I want my application to be fast, and I want my application to be global. So that's why I need to create a CDN, out from distribution, and point to this particular uh, bucket. So I'll go, opening in a different uh, browser, and I'll explain in a second why. Um, create a web distribution. Uh, when you uh, point the, in the browser, it's very important to keep uh, to remember that when you click on what's happening. Okay. When you click on the origin domain name, it suggests automatically all the S3 buckets that you have uh, in that account. Uh, but as I mentioned, we are running a static website hosting. So instead of selecting the bucket, you need to select the static website hosting endpoint. I copy it from here and I put it over there. And you see when I put it the new endpoint, it transforms into a customized endpoint and it asks you this protocols, HTTP for HTTPS, you can create custom headers. Um, and the only thing that I need to do here as well I think that's fine. Yes, this one. The default root object, and there you go. It starts creating a distribution. So this process may take up to 20 minutes. Moving on, I'm going to Lambda, and just for the sake to make it fast, I already uploaded uh, six of the Lambdas. I'll just provide them one example. If you create the same Lambda, uh, it will overwrite. Basically, so let me say I don't have any the blueprint. I want to do to do retrieve lambda that retrieves uh, records from DynamoDB. Upload the code. I have the code over here. It says to do retrieve dot zip and this is the step where I'm specifying that security measure, right? Demo Lambda DynamoDB, this is the um, IAM role that I've created, and here I need to specify. Last but not the least, uh, if you never use Lambda, Lambda is restricted how much time your execution will take. So the maximum you can put it five minutes. Okay, and there you go, it created. API Gateway, in order to create API Gateway, go to the API Gateway service, 
demo to do app. Okay, I don't need to clone for anything. Um, the way API Gateway works, you need to specify, specify methods and resources. Uh, here, I want to, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I need to specify the resource first. And my resource is to do. Okay. And the way we structure the application is in, sorry, you have a question? Yes. On, on the retrieve, um, it was probably obvious to most people, but I, I didn't catch it. Retrieve what? Retrieve records from DynamoDB. So the way uh, we've designed our application is uh, um, to create one Lambda per one HTTP bird, right? Because it's a RESTful API. It's using HTTP GET, HTTP POST, DELETE, uh, and, uh, sorry, yeah, DELETE and PUT. So uh, that's why we're creating one Lambda per different HTTP verb in order to expose them through API Gateway. And that was our personal decision. It's not like an enforced thing. You can do it um, any way you want it. Uh, for those of you who don't want to create Lambdas or don't want to they have already API endpoints, you can specify them, map them into API Gateway, and you can point to existing backends that you already have, and you don't need to develop, build it uh, new. So that, that's one thing. We created the to-do app, and for each to-do app, we have different endpoints. So here I will say uh, the sub-resource of to-do resource is retrieve. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, to keep it simple, uh, I'll just create the, the, the method. Um, I, I won't go into the details of our particular application. Everything that, uh, that will help here is just to have, uh, in this particular case, we're doing uh, the get method and pointing to the um, retrieve lambda. And as I start typing to do retrieve, there you go. There is our retrieve. Okay. Yes. Uh, in this case, it's just one lambda, right? And it takes from the, the lambdas that you already have loaded in, in your lambda service. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry, I need to. <laughs> so you have multiple uh, to-do resources. Yeah. So when you say get slash to-do, is it going to return a collection of all to-do resources? If you do HTTP get slash to-do, yeah. that, will that will trigger only the retrieve lambda. The right. one that I'm but now the pointing. retrieve lambda is going to return one to-do or multiple to-dos? Oh, in this case, um, our Lambda can ret retrieve, um, if you provide us an additional parameter, ID right. equals, so I, I understand what you're trying to, to say. So right. we've combined both the, the list of all of the resources yeah. and retrieve one resource. Right? It's, in, it's so, combined into one. Yeah, it's right. just if right. the parameter, the ID equals is found, right. then we uh, narrow or filter the, the response. Uh, now I understand. The nature That's of what that. I meant by collection. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so we don't have the two different lambdas. We're using one lambda. Um, same you can do with, um, so let's have create a method that says uh, post. And for the method post, we're specifying a lambda that is to do uh, create. That's the equivalent in the RESTful API, right? And so on. So I, I won't I won't continue creating all of that. I'll show you at the end uh, that it points to some other backend. That's other other API gateway. One thing that is very very important because uh, is course right cross origin <laughs> resource sharing in JavaScript. That's very important if you want to be able to to use uh, uh, your code out of S3. You need to enable the uh, the backend to support that. Right? It's just technically it's just a couple of HTTP headers that gets uh, passed from the uh, 
uh, from the client to the server and the other way around. So AWS did it very, very easily so with one click of the button where you say, I want for every uh, for all these endpoints and for all the HTTP me methods, I want to enable course. And done, okay? So as you can see, that's also an additional HTTP verb and it says options. So last but not the least, to wrap up with this uh, demo uh, is creating a table. Creating a table is the same, just specify the table name, uh, demo, to do, app, and what's important uh, for every DynamoDB table, you need just to specify one primary key. That needs to, uh, that's how the table is created. Everything else, it doesn't matter. But the primary key, and it can be just one, uh, one uh, field, or it can be a compound key out of two fields. One is primary key, another one is a hash. Okay. All right, so creating the table. It creates the table, and I am done. So officially, I should be going back. So this one is not finished. I'll go back to S3, and let's see. Fingers crossed if this works. <laughs> All right. So something is moving. Yes. All right. So that's the application, and it actually called the, the back end and exposed the, my to do list. Any questions so far? That's the S3 URL. CloudFront will be available like in 20, 20 minutes. I can, I can try to hit this, but based on experience, I'm sorry, I kind of, kind of cut it short. It's not, it's not, um, it's not provisioned yet. My work. Woo! Yes. <coughs> Thank you. In this architecture, how do you handle uh, scheduled operations like run job or something like that? Uh, that's a very good question, and um, there is no simple answer to that. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm not talking something that I'm not supposed to be talking. <laughs> but, um, sorry, you want to add something? Use Jenkins. Yeah? Use, use Jenkins, use another endpoint, hit it. Um, there are some, some ways to, to do that. I read an article recently. We didn't have those kind of uh, situations, um, use cases, because uh, this approach is not, perf is not ideal for all of the applications. Right? Uh, in media, when you have spiking loads and where you don't need to do uh, um, something on a regular basis, um, again, it depends on the, on the use case. I'm trying to, to be very narrow. Um, we, we don't do it, but there are, there are ways of, um, Amazon provides a uh, simple notification service that integrates with some free services that can trigger a notification on a regular basis. I read an article after the presentation, if you want, I can, I can find it and I can send it to you if you give me the information. But that, that's, that's how would you do it. It uh, triggers an SNS notification, SNS triggers Lambda, and then you do whatever you need to do. I was hoping you could comment a bit more on the uh, SDLC and how this framework impacts this. I could imagine someone down the future being very evil and saying, no local infrastructure, no EC2, you only have this uh, modular framework. Yeah. Can you hold a couple of minutes? Because that's exactly my slides. <laughs> the next couple of next slides. <laughs> okay. 
So let me let me move forward and uh, sorry. Uh, um, let me move forward and uh, after the um, because I'm anticipating uh, some of the questions like like yours, and I'll get back to to, to you. I promise. Okay. So. Um, So what we've learned uh, by doing uh, serverless microservices. Uh, so first is some developers, um, the serverless approach is very challenging because it actually narrows uh, you down and restricts you rather than uh, you can do whatever you want. That's just back to, to, to your question. Right? Uh, some developers find this challenging and they don't want to deal with it because more with constraints is more work thinking, I guess, thinking out of the box. We actually find it very, very, um, uh, we liked it uh, because it helped us to focus and to keep us forced into delivering what's important to the customer and what's important for a particular application. Right? For example, not having alternatives, this is a big one for me personally. Now, having alternatives to services-oriented architecture and application programming interfaces okay, forced everybody to commit and build SOA and APIs. SOA also means that you build services, right? But AWS Lambda is constrained by design to 300 milliseconds to 300 seconds execution time, and maximum that you get in 1.5 gigs. Right? So not to mention browser limitations with uh, responsive design, the presentation we had earlier, and special mobile devices. Right? So that's how we ended up in turning to microservices, right? which I'll be talking about next. So microservices architecture. Microservices architecture is the new trend that makes all of us excited and curious. And believe it or not, but it didn't exist two years ago. I was personally surprised to see that. Um, but what is microservice? What does it mean? Uh, in a nutshell, it's an architectural pattern that can be applied almost anywhere. Either we're talking about infrastructure, and we see how AWS is doing it, Either we're talking about platforms, and by the way, also the, the other major cloud providers like Google and Microsoft are doing it as well, or we're talking about applications. So I personally think of microservices like a shredder of monolithic applications. Right? So you will have a lot of small pieces that you glue them together, and obviously you need very solid processes to do that. Because the more it is, the more complex it feels. But uh, in, in the reality is we are building from complex into something simple. And we are putting together from something difficult into something easy and empower developers. So in a nutshell, if it's software driven, you could apply this design. You could build it as a microservice. Why? use microservices in Drupal, microservices share the same core principle as Drupal. It enables modularity. That's why it's appealing personally to me, and that's why I'm here in front of you guys speaking. Okay. So favorite speakers, Adrian Cockcroft, um, Martin Fowler, Sam Newman. If you, know, if you don't know or never heard of these guys, I want to Bring, bring out or point out Adrian Cockcroft, who is um, a former Netflix chief architect who evangelized and pioneered microservices architecture when it was um, when nobody knew that, right? Uh, as well as uh, in his presentation, the state of the art in microservices, um, Adrian is talking about speeding up. Uh, digital platforms. Right? The milliseconds in deployment time and seconds in execution time really uh, turned us and uh, turned us and pushed us into being early adopters of AWS Lambda. So let me show you an, uh, 
an example of microservices architecture powered by AWS Lambda. So this is a diagram that um, is a third iteration of um, publishing workflow, which, by the way, in the first two iterations, we completely messed up. So if you guys want to hear that story, I'll take it up the, after the presentation or to the bar. Um, back to the third iteration, the context here is that we were building for our digital asset management customers. Um, they needed, they had a lot of assets, microsites, or static marketing websites. We helped them with literally one action, or one click, uh, to migrate everything to AWS. Right? And the assets were either in GitHub, Subversion, or some internal infrastructure. So in a nutshell, what we've done, build a series of lambdas that A, takes them and puts into a processing bucket, then B, triggers execution, processing, extractions, form, load, and takes the metadata, puts in DynamoDB, or puts uh, other files into S3, and C, takes the process files and put into uh, an outbound bucket that is available publicly and so on. So let me share some tips and tricks. Um, AWS Lambda is just one year old. So be open-minded when building code and expect the unexpected. Um, make sure you set up alarms in CloudWatch. You'll thank me later for that. And uh, there are some delivery policy that you can put between S3 and Lambda direct integration. It goes through SNS that you can avoid some scalability issues, which we did. And last but not the least, and it appears in the, in the official documentation, be aware of potential infinite loops. Um, we actually experienced, and that's one of those embarrassing things. Two developers built three different Lambdas that ended up calling each other, and for a couple of hours, we're just consuming money. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so microservices are really game changers that enable speed and security. Because it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's, it makes sense. Because it's very hard to figure out how to attack something that quickly disappears. Right? And, but if you're coming um, from a monolithic architecture, one practical approach that helped us a lot is build a service or a feature first, the way you do it regularly, and then take it and break it down into microservices. So how can we help content management systems like Drupal to embrace microservices architecture? Good question. I thought actually a lot about this topic, Drupal and microservices, and not only for this presentation. And the truth is that I have some ideas, uh, but I have also more questions than answers. Um, and uh, I just decided to leave here a question mark, and hopefully if you guys are excited enough, if it's of your interest, we can start some conversations and uh, drive by community uh, some change and start thinking about this. So what I can tell you for sure that the emerging technology like cloud computing uh, traditionally changes the traditional development cycles, the question that you had. Right? So lots of developers are expected to build using the same process over and over again. And it's even challenging to do it at scale especially big organizations, big media companies, right, uh, to keep it consistent and to keep it to be manageable. The, the complexity goes exponential. Okay. Microservices actually empowers and enables developers to be independent, self-sufficient, highly decoupled, and focused on small and easy tasks. Right. Most important, which I personally appreciate it. it helps developers to define their own processes. Right? You build it, you run it. And also, 
you do it at your own pace, right? Because it's more components, just do one component and just do it. Uh, I personally love it and I would never ever want to go back to monolithic architecture. Well, final demo, and I hope we will have time for questions, is in this demo I'll try to achieve exactly the same goal that I did in the manual demo, right? Only this time I'll do it completely automated. So I'll go to this GitHub repository, look at the README, the getting started um, uh, section, and I'll execute a couple of commands, and that way I will run the application in my own AWS account. Okay, so let's see what happens. So, first of all, this is the repository, this is the, the README, and this is the getting started guide. So the first thing, what you need to do is install that command line. So think of this uh, equivalent, equivalent of, uh, let me make it bigger, all right? Think of this an equivalent of Drush or Drupal console, okay? Um, next step is to get the code from GitHub and to install it locally on your, on your, on your machine, or download it locally on your machine. So we do, we go like this. It takes the code. Additionally, what it does, it, uh, it finds dependencies and loads the dependencies as well. That's, you can do git clone, and probably will we'll, uh, provide you the same functionality. Okay, and um, last but not the least, what it does, it's, it installs Babel, which is in a compiler to transform EC, uh, ES6, ES5 standard, right? Because uh, we enabled it to be back, initialized backend. No, it's fine. Okay, step number three. Um, run the local server. So what we've done, we want to enable developers to build locally on their, on their environment, on their laptops, without having an AWS account or any other cloud provider's account. So you can test everything locally, you don't need to wait. And, all right, so you run the server. Okay. The detected engine Require, ask me for the parameters. I just chose the default, and it starts installing all the things, compiling, uh, and it's a zero. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last step, I actually run it. So you do deploy, which once you're comfortable executing on your local machine, you push it uh, on on the AWS in your cloud. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to show you the example, but maybe you will have internet in the, in the bar and I'll show you the bar. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Wait, does this work? Yeah? All right, very, very quickly, the next meetup is in this room on February 3rd, the first Wednesday in February. Please do make sure that you go to meetup.com and you RSVP. Otherwise, it causes problems and they may not let you in and that would be so terrible and sad. Um, let... Yes. Yeah. If you've already gotten in once without RSVPing, then you've used your get out of jail free card, right? You only everybody gets one, right? Right, Spider-Man fans. Um, so remember, February third, uh, we know that there will be an intro to Graph X, uh, GraphQL presentation uh, by Preston So. So that'll be cool. There will also be a bunch of other presentations. One last reminder: go down to Bill's Bar. The entrance is on Fifty First Street. Um, there's a map even up here, cool, shiny map. Uh, we will be in the downstairs area of Bill's Bar, so when you go in, go in the downstairs area. Um, thank you once again to all of our great speakers, and if you have ideas for it, ah, see, you were the one. Oh, thank you. Um, if you have ideas for talks, come talk to me, come talk to Elijah. Uh, and last but not least, did anybody lose these glasses? They must belong glasses. to someone. Glasses. Glasses, anybody? anyone? Glasses. glasses. Does anybody want these glasses? <laughs> Would anybody like a free pair of glasses? What is that? Is it? Really? <laughs>
All right, thanks everybody. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Everybody out. Okay. Please do. No, they don't show anything in there. All right. Sounds well, excellent. Answer, everyone. Do your best. Thanks. Glad you came. All right. Everybody who's still standing in the room, get out. How are you? Did you enjoy? Uh, I think so.